Max Highlights, and here's your host, Megan Lee. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Highlight Show, where we bring you the latest and greatest picks of the week. Here's a look at what we've got in store for you today. Surf's up. Wales is home to the world's longest man-made surfable wave. Iconic image. Edvard Munch's painting The Scream still fascinates art lovers. And scenic landscape. The Black Forest is among Germany's most popular travel destinations. Europe in summer is boasting an abundance of outdoor festivals. You really have your choice, from opera and rock to movies, beer, and food. And how about a folk culture festival? Well, the Europeada is taking place for the 52nd time this year in Sweden. Now, thousands of people from all over Europe dress in their traditional costumes and meet up to dance to folk music and celebrate. And they prove that traditional attire is certainly not going out of style. Our reporter, Ancha Binder, has the story. Greek folk dancing in Scandinavia. The southern Swedish port city of Helsingborg is hosting a four-day folk culture festival. Greece is represented here, and the Baltic states. In fact, more than 250 regions from across Europe are taking part. They dress up in traditional costumes and perform traditional dances. To, to build Europe from, for the hearts, not economical, not financial, but people bringing together to enjoy, to dance, to sing, to make music, and to show their culture, and to have respect for each other culture. This group comes from Schreiksbach in central Germany. They say their costumes were inspired by the fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood, by the Brothers Grimm. At home, residents of Schreiksbach wear these costumes on local holidays. These costumes were worn by our ancestors. My grandparents and great-grandparents wore them, and now we wear them. People recognize us when we do. You wear these clothes with pride. You can stand up and say, we're representing our homeland. The girls and young women wear red. After they marry, they switch to green to show that they're spoken for. Berlin photographer Gregor Hohenberg is working on a book about these costumes. He's been traveling around Germany for five years, meeting various regional and local groups, and has become a real expert on traditional costumes. There are hidden codes or non-verbal communication in these costumes. If you study the colors, the position of the scarves, the tilt of the hats, you can find out whether someone has reached marrying age, whether they're grieving over a deceased loved one, and so forth. The costumes can tell us a lot. They were sort of like the Instagram and Facebook of their time. Hohenberg also works as a fashion photographer, and that's how he sets up some of his shoots here. These are handcrafted works of art, a wedding outfit from Lower Saxony. Some of the costumes look like they come from Asian regions. They're covered with gold embroidery and glass beads. The patterns, even the gloves, are perfect. It looks like a Paris fashion show. Fashion designers who turned up at this year's Europeada might have been surprised. These items look slightly avant-garde. The folks who are wearing them come from Greenland. Their clothes are part of their ethnic identity. Our costumes, especially the ones that women wear, are completely different. No two are alike. But the colors and the patterns and the way they're all made are traditional. The Greenlanders stage a special performance. A lot of visitors seem surprised that Europe has such a rich history of traditional costumes. 6,000 people are taking part in this festival. That's quite a few. You shouldn't forget your traditions. Life goes on, but you shouldn't forget where you come from, right? 
I think it's great, and I don't find it old-fashioned at all. <laughs> That's just how the folks who attended this year's Folk Culture Festival see it. These costumes aren't museum pieces. They're worn as part of everyday life in many parts of Europe, and young people are continuing that tradition. All right, time now to leave tradition behind and plunge into the future of technology. Now, virtual reality has been around for at least 20 years, but the next trend in the tech, tech industry is virtual reality in 3D. The biggest challenge so far has been making goggles that are both affordable as well as wearable. And this is where big tech companies like Oculus, Sony, and currently the British firm Endream seem to be making inroads, at least that's the big hope at this year's Gamescom in Cologne, where virtual reality is taking center stage. Imagine closing your eyes to everything around you and opening them again on a tropical beach. Once the stuff of fantasy, now virtual reality. Perfect Beach is the creation of a British game developer, Endreams. The company focuses exclusively on virtual world games, it's considered a pioneer in the construction of animated 3D landscapes. The, the biggest differences in developing for VR is the fact that the, uh, the player can look at everything we've made from every angle, every imaginable possible angle. Um, and previously, um, when we used to make games for standard uh, monitors, you could get away with taking parts out or hiding the, you know, the reverse side of an object. Um, so now we have to be a little bit more smart on how we do things where that's concerned. Endream's latest game is a thriller called The Assembly. Players make their way through the virtual world by simply moving their eyes, or the old-fashioned way, by joystick. The impression of three dimensions is created by two slightly different images in the virtual reality glasses display. The player's brain reassembles the images in 3D, creating the illusion of actually being present in the animated world. Endream's CEO, Patrick Oluene, has no doubt that this is the future of video gaming. We just fell in love with VR. We love the feeling of presence, the feeling that you're teleported to another world. The thing about VR that makes it so special is that you're, you're not a spectator looking from, from outside, you're in the action, you're looking around, you actually feel like you're there. And that makes things like emotions very powerful. Fear and happiness and excitement and all sorts of other emotions are much stronger in VR. So um, that's the reason that we fell in love with it. He and his co-workers are hoping gamers in Germany and elsewhere will fall in love with virtual reality as well. Hundreds of thousands of them have descended on Cologne for Gamescom, the world's largest computer and video games trade fair. Many are willing to stand in line for hours to catch a glimpse of the latest releases. Laura Bierling from Augsburg is a dedicated gamer. She comes to Cologne every year to try out the latest innovations. But this is the first time she's ever tried virtual reality glasses. It's something completely new. I play video games on the PC myself, so this kind of game is a stark contrast. You can look around in every direction. After a while, it puts quite a strain on your eyes. I get a headache really fast. This feeling is always there. The graphics just aren't advanced enough yet. But gaming is only one potential application for virtual reality glasses. The University of Regensburg Institute of Psychology is exploring the use of virtual worlds as a therapeutic tool. Here, patients learn to overcome their fear of heights. Criminologists, too, have been experimenting with VR simulations. The University of Zurich's Institute of Forensic Medicine compiles data to reconstruct crime scenes in 3D. Investigators can then walk through it using virtual reality glasses. The head-mounted displays and graphics are not perfect just yet. But teams at the likes of Sony, HTC, Oculus Rift and German optical systems maker Zeiss are working feverishly to put out a marketable pair of VR glasses. So what comes next? 
The entire business, myself included, is certain that this is no flash in the pan. How fast we can make a real success of virtual reality glasses depends on the price and whether there will be cheaper entry-level models. I'm convinced there will be, and how fast convincing game worlds are developed for them. It's only a matter of time before VR glasses are ready for the mass market. The makers still have to work out how to prevent motion sickness, but the first displays are set to hit the stores within months. Until then, we'll just have to put up with everyday reality. All right, Wales is putting itself on the map when it comes to trendy sports. There you can find the longest zip line in Europe, and now, believe it or not, it's marketing itself as a surf destination. That's because the Snowdonia National Park in the Welsh mountains is now home to the longest man-made surfable wave in the world. Here's more. Far from the ocean, at the edge of a national park in northern Wales, surfers wait for the perfect wave. At Surf Snowdonia, state-of-the-art technology creates the world's longest man-made surfing waves. It took years for Fernando Odriozola's company, Wave Garden, to figure out how to create the perfect wave using a minimum of energy. It's making surfing accessible. There are very few places in the world where you can surf. There are really good few places right now with uh, these kind of installations. Anybody in the world will be able to surf. A large underwater blade pulled through the center of the lake creates the artificial waves. They can be up to two meters high. The technology is similar to a ski lift. Odiriozola's company first experimented with the idea at a smaller site in northern Spain, where they also tested surfing at night. Wave Garden isn't the only company that specializes in man-made waves. Many have tried it, but gave it up due to high energy costs. A manufacturer in Scotland holds the current record of creating waves over three meters high. But Fernando Odriozola says size isn't everything. What makes unique our technology is the, is the possibility of, of creating waves that holds the size and holds the power for a long distance. This is exactly what you find in some point breaks in, in, this, in the surfing paradise like Indonesia or, or Hawaii. Surf Snowdonia provides lessons and on-site accommodation. A two-hour beginner course costs around 55 euros. Advanced surfers like Pierre Etienne pay around 64 euros an hour to surf the waves. It's a great way to get in some practice, but in the ocean, the waves are free, and the experience is certainly different. What I'm missing the most is uh, the bonding with the nature. Uh, this uh, interaction that it gives and takes at the same time. That feeling of freedom when you're between the sea and the sky is something you can't recreate. But in the ocean, the surf sometimes gets too rough or too weak. Pros like Kaspar Steinfatz say installations like this could also help establish surfing as an Olympic discipline. The thing with competing in the ocean is you're always at the mercy of the conditions. Here in the wave pool, you can produce the same exact wave again and again and again and that just levels the playing field. Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a great possibility for competitions, especially when looking at the Olympic campaign. Pierre Etienne lives in Geneva, Switzerland. Soon, he may not have to travel so far to catch the perfect wave. Wave Garden is already building 20 other facilities on all five continents. We think the ocean is the best, and uh, we cannot replace the ocean. But we can, we can bring waves where there is no waves. And then I think that's a great combination, combining the ocean with, with the man-made waves. Wave Garden's next park is due to open in the US, in Austin, Texas, more than 2,000 kilometers from the surfer's paradise on the Pacific coast. 
For Texas, they're planning even higher and longer waves. If Wave Garden has its way, surf parks will be the wave of the future. The Scream by Norwegian painter Edvard Munch is one of the most famous paintings in the world, and even more so since the four existing versions of the image have been the target of several thefts and theft attempts. Well, the masterpiece has been reproduced and parodied many times over the years, including most recently as an emoji symbol. Here's a closer look. I was walking along the road with two friends when the sun set. Above the blue-black fjord in city, the clouds hovered like blood and flaming tongues. I felt the great endless scream pass through nature. That's how Norwegian artist Edvard Munch described his iconic painting, The Scream. He completed four versions of it. What makes the painting so powerful is its ability to trigger emotions in people the minute they see it. It's been reinterpreted countless times. The poster for the 1982 film The Wall, based on the Pink Floyd album, is a coveted collector's item. In the 1996 American slasher film Scream, the killer wears a mask based on Monk's painting. Norwegian cartoonist Avid Andreasen published a book featuring more than 300 reworkings and parodies of the motif. It continues to capture imaginations the world over. The Scream from Nature is a project dreamt up by Norwegian artist Lisa Wolf. She encourages people to create their own version of the famous painting and to upload it to an online Scream gallery. The reason why I started working with the Scream is uh, based on the environmental concerns and uh, the text by Munch that he wrote that he felt this huge scream through nature. And that's also an interesting point since many people tend to think that it's the person screaming, the person we see in the, the scream. But we don't know that, so maybe it's a person protecting his ears from this horrible scream. Or it may be the person, because we are also nature. In the Norwegian capital, Oslo, the scream has been exhibited in the National Gallery since 1893. It also went on display in Berlin the same year. It was given a mixed reception. To more conservative critics, it was just a mess. The painting unleashed a major scandal. And not just this painting. Originally, it was part of a series known as the Freeze of Life. But when it stands alone, it's much stronger. It's because it's so elemental, so stripped down. Its basic idea is one we can all relate to. We can't even tell if it's a man or a woman, someone old or someone young. It's just a human being reaching out with a highly charged appeal to us. The figure in the foreground casts a spell of despair. Adding to the overpowering sense of oppression is the balustrade that cuts diagonally across the picture. In the background to the left are two figures who could be coming or going. The colors of the sky and the landscape contrast to striking effect. Layered as they are, they almost look like sound waves. His painting style, steeped in intensity, made Edvard Munch a pioneer of expressionism. His work remains profoundly influential. Around 450,000 visitors flock to the National Gallery in Oslo every year to admire this landmark painting. People react very differently. People often have their picture taken striking the same pose. We see loads of school kids making the same face and gesture. But we sometimes see some very emotional scenes. People standing in front of it for a long time and actually crying. In 2012, one of the four original versions of the Scream sold for about 110 million euros. It's one of the most expensive paintings ever to go on auction. Maybe it manages to 
convey a feeling of anxiety and unease that many people recognize. The scream has been referred to in music, it's been used in comics, there's even an emoticon of the scream symbol on WhatsApp. It's one of the most reproduced masterpieces of all time. It's not a beautiful painting, but it draws us in. It forces us to think. We have no choice but to respond to it, as though an actual person was screaming right in front of us. DW.com slash culture, your address for arts and culture on the net with the best in music, film, and literature. You can also find audio streams of classical music concerts, along with our many cultural programs as video on demand. There's something for everyone. It's time now to take a trip, and today we're heading to one of the most popular destinations here in Germany. I'm talking about the Black Forest. Well, it's not just an inspiration for bakers. It's also a haven for nature lovers. So get ready to pack your bags as we take you on a journey through tranquil mountains, flowing rivers, deep valleys with calming lakes, and even to a classic cuckoo clock workshop. The Black Forest truly has it all. With its landmark cathedral, Freiburg in southern Germany is a good starting point for a jaunt into the Black Forest. The university city is also famous for the centuries-old system of water streams trickling through the old town. Michael Gier studied German here and decided to stay. The region is so attractive because the countryside is so varied. You can walk or cycle. The weather is usually great here in the south, and in the evening you can sit in the cafes, have a drink, enjoy the weather. That's what makes it so nice. The Glottertal Valley is nearby. For many, it's the Black Forest at its most picturesque. Just to the southeast of the valley is Lake Titisee. The weather gods pamper the Black Forest with a lot of sun, so it's great to go swimming in one of the many lakes. Titisee is one of 30 lakes in the Black Forest. It's about 40 meters deep in parts, and it's especially popular with families. With its dense tapestry of pines and firs, the Black Forest's name originated in the Middle Ages. Local crafts center around woodworking, and the most famous export is, of course, the cuckoo clock. clocks have been around since 1730. The Rombach und Haas company in Schonach has been making them for more than a century. It all began with this model. It's called a shield clock and it's hand painted. It's an original kind of cuckoo clock, but we designed a different model seven years ago, a modern one. And now we make very modern clocks. And they all chime. <laughs> this clock is 50 times larger than your average cuckoo clock. When it was built in 1980, it was the biggest cuckoo clock in the world. Schonach's traditional Black Forest hat with its 14 red pom-poms is also larger than life. Not far away, in Triberg, is perhaps the most famous waterfall in Germany. It's more than 160 meters high. The Feldberg is the region's highest mountain. It measures 1,500 meters and is located in the south of the Black Forest. I'm fascinated by the fresh air, good weather and landscapes. I love the nature. You can hike and cycle here. There are many possibilities. If you climb up to the top of the tower, you can see over to the Alps on a clear day. Michael Gier now works in a cafe in Freiburg. It's an ideal place to end a summer's day in the Black Forest. And with that, we wrap up another action-packed week of Euromax. Now, don't forget to check us out on our website to see the show again or to find out more about the program. You can also like us on Facebook if you haven't already been on our page. 
But for now, from me and the rest of the crew here in Berlin, have a great weekend, and we'll see you right back here again next week.